Okay, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. My name is Frank Katita. I'm a senior strategist for Chime, uh, and I'm going to be moderating the uh, the panel today. Uh, the panel will focus on the um, what we call sometimes hacks that get people up to level ten in our digital health most wired survey. Um, so we want to make sure that we're looking at forward thinking approaches to uh, healthcare transformation, especially digital transformation, and. Uh, we're delighted to have today two guests, one being uh, Lauren Pettit, who's the godfather of the Digital Health Most Wired survey, who puts that together, and uh, our sponsor and uh, other panelists, such as uh, Jessica Jowdy, who is a, a the manager of healthcare sales engineering at InterSystems, which I think we all know in terms of the interoperability sector. So uh, I'd like to start out with uh, just a brief introduction. Uh, Lauren, if you want to just start, and then you could toss it over to Jessica for a day in the life of a healthcare, healthcare sales engineer at InterSystems. Yeah. Very good. Thanks, Frank. I uh, don't think I've ever been called the godfather of anything, but I guess as I'm uh, aging, we're, we're getting there. Um, the Most Wired program is a program that Chime acquired back in 2018. Mm -hmm. I was... Um, brought on in 2021 to uh, bring some more scientific um, rigor, if you will, for, to, to the program. And the program has been around for a number of years, uh, starting from the American Hospital Association. But to be sort of as a social researcher and a digital health scientist in, in many ways, that you know, it was being able to bring that uh, mindset to the most wired and looking to really trying to elevate the whole program. And so that's uh, sort of my whole focus and, and uh, really involved of, uh, really excited that we have uh, Jessica with us here today of um, with InterSystems. Jessica? Yeah, it is wonderful to be here. Um, at InterSystems, we are, uh, we have the pleasure of being able to tackle some of the most complicated interoperability uh, challenges that exist within the healthcare space. Uh, recently, InterSystems has gone on an adventure to uh, determine the high level of maturity that our clients have had in the integration and interoperability space and find ways to continue to push the bounds of what we can do with healthcare interoperability. So I'm really excited to be here today to talk a little bit more about that and strategies that uh, organizations can have to improve their maturity. Jessica, how does a sales engineer interface with the, the clients that you have? Oh, it's a great question. So we have the, as I said, we have the pleasure of really having that uh, first kind of uh, unfiltered interaction with our clients and so healthcare organizations. Um, so we're able to hear directly from uh, clients what kind of problems they're facing, uh, what kind of solutions they're they're looking into and kind of work with them on, on seeing how InterSystems technology can, can help them satisfy some of those interoperability requirements and allow them to become, or to begin innovating off of that foundational work. That's great, that's great. So, so just as a start, um, Lauren, we, we, we wanna frame this as driving to level 10 in, in terms of digital health, uh, most wired. Um, what do you see the greatest differences are between the people at the lower levels and the ones that really reached the level 10 uh, nirvana of the survey in, 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 right. in this past year? Right. Um, <clears throat> there'll be, you know, analytics is certainly one. There's um, innovation and um, we have, you know, patient engagement and um you know, interoperability, those are four areas that I would highlight. But if I may, just so again, for to level setting for those that may not be familiar with the Most Wired program, uh, I'd like to sort of spend just a few moments talking about the program and then the levels and, and why driving to level 10 is such a, a big driver, but big interest in, in healthcare systems. And then I'll circle back to each of those areas we just talked about, analytics and, and the like. As I said earlier, you know, the Most Wired program has been around for a long time. <clears throat> I think it actually started in 1998 from the American Hospital Association. And it really is one, one of the, those sort of first surveys that was in the healthcare ecosystem to look at the use of technology, healthcare technology in healthcare organizations. And um, it, it has really sort of over the years has been really embedded in the DNA of healthcare organizations that, you know, every year 
there's the annual survey that um, beginning in April, and uh, we'll re you know reference this a few times today, but the survey is opening for the 2004 April one. Every year, April is the day or the, the the month, and then we start collecting uh, information from these healthcare organizations on their data anal uh, on their use uh, of technology. Um, and as I said in, in 2018, Chime took it over, and we really tried to um, really sort of change the program somewhat, or really sort of elevate it. Um, it, it had been gained part of the, the whole DNA of, of organizations, but we really wanted to take it to a next level. Next level in the sense that it was a recognition program, and that's why we talk about you know striving for level ten. When you think about in the healthcare ecosystem, most wired is is actually one of those renowned um, awards and recognitions that healthcare organizations and healthcare leaders aspire to. <clears throat> so that's why again, this is really significant when you talk about driving to level ten. But I, I also want to emphasize that one of the things that um, when I was brought on is to really help elevate this as a benchmarking tool. And so this is again why it's so significant having Jessica here is that uh, a lot of organizations are using the most wired report as a, um, a data point when they talk with, with mm -hmm. their different uh, solution providers and to be give, give a sense of you know what's going on in the market. What what else could we be doing? So again, this is why there's really nice um, coexistence here of having Jessica here uh, to answer your question, of, of Frank. Again, you know, it's driving to level ten. Why that is so significant? Um, again, it's the recognition and in the areas where organizations have really um, differentiated the the level ten organizations, and I can go through a litany of some of the names that you know most everybody here would know. Um, as level 10 organizations, the, the, you know, the biggest differentiator between um, the level 10s and everybody else was in the realm of analytics. And we sort of you know, unpack that and sort of, you know, it sort of makes sense when, you know, you can't go to any vendor conference right now and not hear AI, or you can't open up, you know, anything in, in health IT and be, you know, hear anything about it. It's just, it's, all around uh, artificial intelligence. Right. I don't believe it's actually, uh, by the way, you know, the the latest shiny object. Uh, I mean, you know, we've had in this industry things that come and go. Um, I really do believe that AI is, is here to stay. And so that's, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I think is really driving that in this in this space in terms of differentiating between the larger organizations or the, you know, the level 10 organizations who've really said, you know, they've had the data scientists, they've had, you know, really uh, using um, these tools and, and being able to put those in place. I, and again, there's, uh, I highlighted a few other areas, innovation, you know, being associated with a hub. Um, but one of the, the key products, if you will, that the level 10s, uh, level 10 organizations were, were quite different from everybody else was around you know the remote uh, monitoring technologies they seem to be sort of ahead in that space um and then you know the you put sort of a few of these things together and you, you know you you start to see um patterns uh, in the marketplace and you know are we really sort of seeing that innovation and analytics together is it you know we're starting to see the hospital at home drive um, is one of those things. Is that sort of what, what seems to be emerging? Um, and then I'll just sort okay. of land on, you know, two other areas was patient engagement as a section was also an area where it was differentiated from other organizations. So, and, and again, when we think about patient centric care, um, you know, the patient engagement uh, questions that are in our survey are in many ways sort of the tip of the spear uh, barometer of how organizations are embracing, um, you know, digital health tools and this whole digital front door concept that, you know, we also hear about. And then finally, it's, and again, why it's really significant with Jessica here is interoperability was another area where we saw some differentiation between level tens and, and everybody else and much more uh, attuned and, and advanced in their interoperability capabilities. That's great. That's a great start.
Uh, and it, it's great that we're focusing on analytics and, and, um, and artificial intelligence is, is becoming like oxygen that you have to talk about, but uh, uh, we're always looking for that, that hyphen with artificial intelligence, as I like to call it. And uh, we don't want to always get confused to, with, between artificial intelligence and analytics. Uh, Jessica, I know, you know, Intersystems, uh, this is not a commercial pitch, but uh, we know as a fact that many of the uh, the level 10s are, are using Intersystems platforms. Uh, they're also using your analytics. And, and as we move forward, and currently they're using some capabilities that are AI related. Could you tell us a little bit about that analytics part of your business and, and how that's tying in to this, this massive evolution to these things called, whether shiny or not, these things called artificial intelligence? Yeah, I, I have a couple of points to, to lead into that. Um, to start with, uh, I think we talk about artificial intelligence like it's the new kid on the block, but AI has been around for a while. I think the introduction of Gen AI and the popularity with which those kinds of algorithms have been adopted, not just in the healthcare space or looking to be adopted in the healthcare space, but in every industry has made the general population more accepting of the use of AI and ML in their day-to-day -day lives. So while I don't think it's a new fad, it is new uh, that the popularity is there. And what we found is that when working with analytics, I'll say that more generally, whether that's artificial intelligence based or, or not, um, the need for data is really the driving force um, behind any successful adoption of an AI initiative. Uh, so AI uh, requires, typically I should say, requires massive amounts of, of data to be able to construct models and, and algorithms that appropriately identify the situations that you're looking for. Um, and when we think about healthcare and the mission criticality of a lot of the things that we're building, data has to be paramount because we must get these things right. Um, and so we, you know, I, we go back to, I'll, I'll always bring us back to interoperability because that has a soft spot in my heart. Uh, mm -hmm. but the interoperability piece of being able to bring data together, uh, whether that information lives in silos, whether it lives in, across different organizations, the capability of, of centralizing that information in a way to then drive those kinds of, um, AI ML based initiatives is paramount. And it's not just bringing that information together, it's also ensuring that that information is clean, that it's harmonized, uh, because if, as everyone who's gone through uh, through an analytics initiative knows, uh, garbage in, garbage out every time. So when we talk about interoperability, it's not just the sheer connectivity piece of it, but it's scrubbing that information and ensuring that it is ready to, to actually be used for these kinds of, of projects. So I, I think of that as kind of that foundational piece by which our clients end up driving analytical strategies. And then they have a jumping off point. Uh, we, we find that every organization has different kinds of initiatives and focuses that they are trying to achieve. Uh, but the, the core uh, foundational requirement of having the data together is not unique. Uh, that is a commonality across all those different uh, situations. And are, are, do you have any observations about the prioritization where, where a lot of these companies are, are sticking their toe into the water, whether it be AI, uh, advanced analytics, or, or machine learning? Is, is there is, uh, you know, we, we hear that some are, are, are focusing on mundane work processes and others are getting very close to uh, a clinical decision support. Uh, is, are, do you have any observations in the work that you're doing out in the field? Yeah, I think it it's really dependent on how far along an organization's policy is uh, regarding the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in their workflows, right? I think right. that's the 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 question that's lingering for a lot of organizations that are itching to get into this space is, you know, what are the uh, ramifications, whether that's legal or policy based. That might um, that could potentially interfere with what I'm trying to accomplish. So the technology is kind of interesting because the technology is there, but our utilization or our policy around the utilization of that technology might not have caught up yet. And once again, in healthcare, where we're dealing with you know the the well-being of people, uh, we have to get that right. 
Um, so as far as the different uh, avenues that people are exploring, um, I think there is, um, you know, one path that's looking at, you mentioned mundane, I think it's kind of interesting, uh, the operational side of being able to automate some back end tasks or the creation, um, being able to uh, essentially create certain uh, components uh, from the usage of, uh, of AI and ML technologies. Right. We are seeing that, uh, which is uh, which could arguably be um, a lower risk-based usage of AI or ML. Right. Uh, whereas when we're seeing things that involve patient care, uh, we're seeing a lot of that being in a proof of concept or evaluation stage uh, mm -hmm. where there still needs to be kind of some boundaries drawn around the usage of it. Uh, but as I said before, the technology is there with interoperability, the data is there. And so we're in a really good position to see that evolve in, over time. We're, we're seeing that as well. And I, I think two takeaway points. One is that some of the radiology people are saying, you know, what's so new about this AI stuff? We've been doing this for years, like you pointed out. Uh, and the other part is that when you start talking about the cast of characters that are involved in these deployments, uh, the whole area of governance, which we'll try to touch on a little bit later, becomes very, uh, very complicated. Mm -hmm. Lauren, I think yeah. you had a question. Yeah, yeah just, I mean, I, one of the things I was so excited about have you on this is, you know, we have, you know, as we talk about the hacks to get to level 10, um, you know, we've talked with, uh, you know, the CIOs and, you know, in terms of, you know, what are they doing to to try and elevate it? But it's actually sort of um, the beauty is having the other side, right? You know, the the organizations, the solution partners that are working with the organizations. And when you start thinking about some of these sort of complex issues that you know to be able to get to level ten, analytics, um, AI, or even you know interoperability. I mean, these are sort of a big lift. And I'm really interested from your standpoint, especially from, again, you know, the sales engineer, what are those type of things that you're looking for to say this is, this is a, you know, a, an organization that is ready to go or, you know, let, let's hope we've got a few other things to do. And, and, and look, they should just hear your, your perspective on, on that because really significant in driving to level 10. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So we have um, certain um, uh, metrics, if you will, uh, looser metrics than the level 10, uh, you know, uh, calculations that we evaluate or that we look at our clients uh, with to determine kind of where they land on that innovation uh, maturity scale as it pertains to, to interoperability. I think uh, there's a lot of different aspects. I'll call out a few. Uh, one of the first things we look at are the types of data that they're working with. If we find that organizations are really um, working with uh, sheerly information within the EMR, um, that's great. Uh, there's opportunities for, for improvement and growth by starting to leverage information that lives outside of the EMR, whether that's other ancillary applications that that organization operates or even what's become um, more popular these days is working with external data coming from national networks like the Commonwealths and the Care Qualities and the EHXs of the world. So the use or the scope of what data is being uh, used uh, and the types of data that are being used, right? What kind of clinical, or is it just clinical domains? Are we looking at operational information, financial information? Are we somehow you know, uh, breaking down the barriers across those data domains to start to develop new insights beyond that data. Um, so that whole, that's one concept we really look at. Um, we're also very interested in the access of information for different organizations. So uh, data is only as good as how many people can actually use it. So maybe those silos are being broken down, but there aren't any consumers that are actually interacting with it, maybe because security policies and governance haven't been well established, maybe because there's an education issue and people don't know about it. So not only do we look at you know the data that we brought in, but how many people are actually interacting with it and how easily are you making that accessible to those people that are innovating off of it? Have you stood up APIs? Do you have, you know, other means by which, you know, we've talked about data fabrics with some organizations, like how are people actually able to, to consume 
all that hard work that you've put into bringing that information together. Um, we also look at adoption of certain kinds of interoperability accelerators like uh, EMPIs and other tools um, of that nature to start to capture identities across organizations. We look at um, data cataloging, we look at metadata management, uh, lineage, is all those all you know come back to this fact of being able to create this connected kind of fabric of information. Uh, so they all kind of point towards a more, I'd say, innovative, a more mature organization. We have other factors. Uh, those are just uh, a few that that we've seen. Well, thank you for allowing yeah, me. To, thanks, Frank, for allowing me to jump in there. I just that's okay. No, no, anytime, anytime. I it just raised another question because I, I you know, I'm a, a student of. Uh, unstructured data. So I'm just wondering in your experience that given this massive increase in the number of conversational type devices and mm -hmm. and and, and uh, wearables and things like that, uh, are, are, are you finding that there's a, an exponential increase in unstructured data that is trying to find a home and 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 more importantly, trying to find insight? And, and it, again, it's garbage in, garbage out. And right. we, know the, we know the data hoarders say, I don't want to get rid of anything because at some point in the next 10 years, it might become important. So if I get rid of it now, I'll never get it back. Yeah, I also, uh, I believe, and I don't know the actual percentage, but the majority for years, the majority of the data that we capture for a patient is unstructured. 80%. Uh, I think is that is a yeah. misconception yeah. sometimes. Yeah. So, you know, all of the clinical notes and the guidelines, all of that is in unstructured text. Mm -hmm. And the easy win is always to leverage discrete information to drive change, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think historically, it's been challenging to work with unstructured uh, data just because we haven't had the appropriate means by which we could mine that. Right. There have been NLP tests technologies and, and a lot, you know, there have been some that have been very successful over the years. Um, it is very curious to see how the introduction of Gen AI based technologies might start to mine that information uh, more easily and be able to surface uh, certain insights that have otherwise been lost. Um, I think we're a little ahead of our skis on that. Um, right. I also think unstructured text can be challenging when starting to look at things from a from a population view. You know, you have situations where you need to start de-identifying information right. to drive certain kinds of initiatives, and unstructured text is just uh, a very complicated uh, problem to solve with that. Well, it, it, I mean, it's interesting because you have the challenge of of being able to manage and, and translate unstructured text, and then in your business, making it interoperable. Mm -hmm. across systems that have absolutely no capability of doing that, but making sure that the most critical parts of that are embedded. So I, I just want to change the tide just a little bit. I mean, with, with all these new technologies and the events of the last month with change uh, and, and, and the um, uh, change, the, the company and the data, uh, I mean, there, there's obviously incredible vulnerabilities here, some of which people get totally blindsided uh, by and, and, and and I think that we're finding, and as we've seen in the news, that this this is a virus that it it hits so many other things that we never thought it would hit. Like I can't get my prescription this afternoon uh, when mm -hmm. I thought it was just a data breach. So I, I'm just wondering if you have a point of view on on you know how organizations that are aspiring to be level ten are 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 or should be handling these vulnerabilities as they approach their strategies. I always recommend for organizations to have a really strong, uh, we call it a global trust team at InterSystems, but a strong security policy team. Um, because while we can provide recommendations, we don't know an organization's environment quite as intimately as an organization like that. Um, you know, as it pertains to, you know, the, uh, I would say generally as we look at you know, investments in technologies that might live outside of my on-prem environment, right? And we start to introduce other kinds of solutions. Uh, we definitely encourage organizations to go through uh, very robust uh, security questionnaires and security reviews of that technology, which is what we engage with with our own services, uh, because we really want to make sure that organizations understand what that technology is providing. Uh, they understand, you know, what 
kinds of remediation uh, they would need to do in the event of an issue. Uh, so, you know, I would just encourage organizations to have a really strong dialogue with that security policy team uh, to make mm -hmm. sure everyone is on the same page. And Frank, if I could sort of dovetail on, on that too, and just sort of bringing it back with the insights from the Most Wired survey, one of the interesting things is this was not an area of the um, instrument where the level 10s differentiated too much from everybody else. Uh, it, everybody sort of gets it and, you know, the, the organizations themselves across the board did fairly well. And, you know, we continue to raise the bar on the survey instrument and the survey questions. Um, but this is one area that, again, they didn't really differentiate. And I will sort of add one other component to this is that we do ask a question at the very end, which is, um, what are your top priorities? You know, so you've gone through the entire survey. Looking back, you know, what are your top priorities for the next 12 months? And even though they score very well in the, the security section, it is head and shoulders the number one issue, as it should be. Did you have some thoughts on pop health as well, Lauren? That uh, we yeah. About? So you know, again, we sort of talked about this whole area of uh, interoperability, um, and and we've collapsed interoperability and population health together into the survey instrument. And you know, we, we sort of get one of those questions of you know why, but in many ways, you know, uh, pop health doesn't really help or exist without interoperability. And so there is a, a real significant, you know, um, pairing of those two together. And I just sort of, you know, to go back to the, you know, the primary question here of the hacks towards level 10, 10 how do we, you know, drive to level 10 in this one area, interoperability and population health? Um, I, I, there were a few things that sort of uh, popped up for me that caught my attention that I, I, I thought that there were some differences here and again, sort of trying to pull in a, in a pattern. Um, when we look at the type of organizations that healthcare um, hospitals, health systems are able to share uh, data with and receive data with and be able to really sort of um, pull that information in, that's discrete data and, and, and you know, put it into their EHRs. What is really interesting is that there seemed to be um, on the horizon this growing interest and ability to interact with the sort of the freestanding organizations, freestanding um, ERs, the, the urgent care center. So when you think about yet another venue that uh, patients are coming into the health system, there seems to be getting more data sharing amongst the level 10s with these sort of newer um, front doors, if you will, um, in, into the, the hospital. So that, that was one thing that sort of came up. Okay. The, the other part was, again, you know, around the population health area. And again, you know, we drilled down into specific sort of um, behaviors or actions and, and technology supporting uh, different uh, population health activities. And the area where there seemed to be some variance between the level 10 organizations and everybody else was around this area around you know remote um, care for chronic care patients. Um, and, and you know again, is this sort of the the bleeding edge of the hospital at home initiatives that we're starting to see? Um, but I, I do think that you know again, that's such a significant, play there with interoperability, being able to, you know, capture and share data in, in a home environment um, is, is one of those areas that, again, the level 10 organizations may be leading on. It would be very interesting to watch. Yeah. Uh, Jessica, I, 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 it, it, companies like InterSystems might strangle me for saying something like this, but I heard a, a, a renowned healthcare leader say that interoperability in many cases is not a technology issue mm -hmm. and and th that brings up the question we, we could we could poke holes in in that person who run a major hospital uh network um but what do you think about the the, the whole area of silos here i mean it, you know it, it, in many of those cases some of them have nothing to do with technology 
in others they have everything to do with technology mm -hmm. so so what what do you do out in the field what, what do you see out there in the field in terms of silos uh that you could break down with technology and and the others that you probably as, a, as an organization have to break down from a cultural point of view mm -hmm. yeah that's that's a great question so i think uh in a perfect world, right, there would be no silos. And I think that is very aspirational. Good like luck. there are reasons why there are silos that exist. Um, some have a well-defined purpose and some may not have as strong of a purpose. Right. So uh, as far as why silos are, or why we see silos being created, some of those are technical reasons. Uh, maybe organizations are creating data marts or individual data stores to satisfy a particular requirement. And the technology behind that is, you know, I have a set of users that really only need to have access to this piece of information, right? So maybe I'm going to create a silo off of that. And then now I'm of the, I have the utmost confidence that they can only see this particular piece of information. Um, silos get naturally created as we expand out our application sets. Uh, so you naturally have different data silos every time you introduce a new application that captures data. Uh, some organizations end up setting up uh, EDWs, enterprise data warehouses, or data lakes to help mitigate that uh, mm -hmm. and try to consolidate information. Um, but you can end up having those data swamps or situations where we're just dumping data for the purpose of dumping data, uh, but not actually creating value in the consolidation of that information. So just on that point, a data swamp rather than a data lake, is that what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <that>? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was you're, recently... You might, you, might, you, you, might have only heard, you might have heard it here first, so I, 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 I love that. <laughs> Oh, there's many different, there's data lakes, data lake houses, data swamps. And recently yeah. I've been told a data cabana, uh, oh, but I have nice. not had a chance nice. to look nice. that one into wanna, that I wanna, one. I want to, I want to research that one. Okay, great. <laughs> That's good. Have you, have you seen, I mean, in, in, in saying that, I mean, not the, not the swamp part, but it, it's pertinent. So uh, have you seen any incentives to get people to be more prone to, to share data. I remember in the media business, which I've been for a long time, it was almost impossible to get the people from the expo division to share, to share their data, no matter, no matter what you did. All the magazine people shared it freely, and then the expo people said, not, not here. Are, are there any tips or tricks that you've seen that companies, like a reward, that, that the more data you share, the more? Right. I, I, I would say there's there's two different kind of challenges with data sharing, right? There's internal to the organization data sharing, and then there's external, right? right, um, right. And Good so point. from from an internal perspective, uh, that is really, there's, there's a couple of things that drive that governance policies, right? Mm -hmm. And the ease by which uh, data can be shared. And a, a lot of organizations have uh, resources that are busy enough doing their day to day that adding on um, onboarding information that doesn't have or pertain to them might not be their highest priority, right? So as far as an incentive, I think aligning on a common goal is really important uh, because if we're just, you know, sharing data for the sake of it, then that might be a lower priority for right. organizations that are already strapped pretty uh, tightly in the kinds of tasks that they're going through. Um, from going back to that idea of kind of data silos and data consolidation, um, I think that this concept of whether or not interoperability is is a technology <laughs> problem or something else, you know, the there is a a business conversation as to whether those silos need to exist, right? Mm -hmm. There might be ways that we can mitigate those silos. Um, whether that's in some cases standing up these data lakes or data warehouses. Um, more recently, we're seeing the introduction of data lakes, or not data lakes, uh, data fabrics and data meshes that allow for this connected fabric of information to really support interoperability. So I think that there are technologies, I am biased, but I do think that there are technologies in place to really mitigate the challenges of interoperating and sharing data. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, an organization needs to create a culture in which data sharing is, is um, celebrated and incentivized, right? But then, but you want to make sure that the barriers to share data are low, right? And that's where I think technology can help. That's good.
You know, if I can just sort of jump in for just for a second, I have a quick question about about the incentive uh, incentives here, um, and uh, this is a question that came up to, in my mind here. But it, you know, when we think about the use of personal technologies that organizations and employers are bringing in to the, the workforce, um, does that have any impact at all? Or can you imagine of, of you know, is, it, is that accelerating? the drive for uh, interoperability or, or, you know, is it, you know, sort of slowing things up? I'm very curious. So when you refer to personal technologies, those mean. Um... So the employees that can bring their own devices to work. You know, oh, I see. The old, BYO, the old BYOD. BYOD, yes, I apologize. Yeah. So, you know, think of the, the, their phones and, and that type of stuff. Um, I see. Uh, I think that kind of integration when you're dealing with the introduction of personal devices that aren't controlled by the organization should be thought of very carefully because, uh, you you know, you don't know which data, what data is coming from and what policies govern that information and if there's anything else that shouldn't be in there. So I think the bringing in information from personal devices I go back to that uh, security policy team that every uh, organization has. It should definitely be um, be considered, or that team should definitely consider possible ramifications of leveraging that data. Uh, beyond that, you know, when you're dealing with personal data, because it comes from different locations, the uh, cleanliness of said data should also be, you know, brought into consideration if you're merging together information from many different devices uh, and those devices aren't standardized, then the usefulness of that data might not be as high as you're hoping. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Again, I'm just we're curious if, if that was any part of an incentive of, you know, employees now saying, I've, I've got my own technology and my own devices. And that might spur again spurring the organizations on to uh, make sure these interoperability, uh, the exchanging of data works properly. But all right, thank I you. Think, yeah, I think from an engagement standpoint, though, uh, with with organizations rolling out um, mobile apps and other methods of capturing data, they provide a standardized mechanism by which that data can be used and fed into you know secure systems without introducing as much risk. Uh, so I think we're seeing, you know, that roll out a little bit more because it's allowing, you know, end users to essentially take control of data a little bit more, but with some kind of guardrails around it. So so sort of the future question, you know, we all go to AI conferences and, and a lot of the ones that I go to and, and in fact had put on in previous lives, uh, speakers would get up and say, in five years from now, you, you wouldn't recognize this. It's going to look like your father's AI. Uh, I'm just wondering, from InterSystems' point of view, what what you see the you know the 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 future being like. It, it's going to get to this, but we're not quite there yet. And, and secondly, and perhaps most important in a way, is is how does the workforce adjust to to those kinds of changes? And in fact, how does it adjust right now? I mean, you're working. In, in the sales engineering department, and I'm sure you're saying, God, you, I, they just don't have the workforce to do the kind of stuff that needs to be done because it's competitive or it's just not existing. People are burning out. So what are your thoughts on that, Jesse? I, knowing what has happened in the last three years, I don't know if I can comment what five years <laughs> It could be, the next, could be the next, next uh, let's stick to the next two months, which is like an era already. I know, it's it's so rapidly changing. Yeah. Um, I, my, my guess, um, my personal guess uh, would be that at that point in time, we will have developed kind of the, the policy and structure around the uh, adoption of AI to the point where the, um, or I should say AI and ML, uh, to mm -hmm. the point where the kind of pilots and, and proofs of concept that are rolling out and getting tested, right, are actually deployable. Um, and that there are, you know, governance policies and, and, and teams that have been assembled to maintain this and to ensure the quality of the kinds of initiatives that are being rolled out, especially for end user based solutions. 
Um, so from a workforce perspective, I think that involves the creation of new teams that haven't quite haven't existed within organizations. Right. So I think there's a lot of uh, new talent that needs to be hired on the technology side. Right. So obviously data scientists mm-hmm. um, on the subject matter expert side. Right. So people that understand the data that you're working with. Uh, and then individuals that can actually ensure that the, there's value coming out of that. Um, and then finally, your policy, right, your security team. And so I don't believe for across all organizations, right, or across most organizations, I don't think all of those teams exist yet. Um, so I think we're going to see an uptick in that. Um, I also think the whole concept of supply and demand will kick in. Uh, and while we might have a talent shortage now, knowing where technology is going, I think the skills that um, that talent is looking to acquire will start to move toward these skills that we now need to hire into or to create these teams. So, you know, maybe now we might be at a talent shortage to fill these groups or these these teams. But I think in the future, because of that demand, we'll see uh, a better, you know, pool or selection that organizations can pull from. I agree. I, well, I, I think, I, go ahead. No, oh, Frank, I'm so sorry. I, I, I had the comment here just, uh, you know, uh, ask a question because, you know, it is so significant. Again, Jessica, with you being with the sales engineering, it's, it, you know, you mentioned about, you know, a, across organizations and, and that they really, they're not all the same. And and I it, I see the same thing with the most wired uh, survey because th- it's aspirational to get level 10, but there are challenges um, geographically, you know, uh, regional, the size type of issues. For example, and if I can give you an example here, when we, we have talked a lot about um, analytics, you know, when we look at um, the, the survey itself is that, you know, there is a growing number of organizations that have a, a chief analytics officer or, or somebody in, in that type of role. But when we start breaking it down, by the size of the organization, you know, you think about um, urban, rural, there's a big difference. The CIO has that, wears that multiple hats, you know, and becomes the jack of all trades. And we're seeing, you know, sort of masters occurring in, in some organizations. And so, again, from a, you know, the sales engineering standpoint, when you're looking at some of these, you know, in technologies that you're implementing across uh, these areas, you know, what are some of the challenges? And, you know, because that would be a really significant insight for, you know, some of those that are really trying to hit that that level 10. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, the, the larger the organization, the uh, typically the more resources that organization has to dedicate to um, innovation and some of the, you know, the the aspects that you talked about that, that reach level 10. And for smaller organizations that those resources might not be as prevalent, right? And we have people wearing multiple hats and and that definitely poses a challenge. Um, What we've seen uh, with those organizations is strong partnerships with uh, vendor organizations to help fill in those gaps, right? So being able to work with vendors that accelerate the adoption of certain kinds of uh, technologies or uh, certain kinds of initiatives, instead of having to take all of that on in-house, allows them to accelerate their their innovation without having to acquire the resources required required to make that happen. Good point. One of the questions we have from the uh, studio audience here is, is is there a change in what you're seeing in terms of governance groups for all of this? Obviously, AI has governance. Cybersecurity has always had governance. Uh, I, I'm assuming that interoperability, to some extent or another, has governance. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of the composition of these governance teams? Has it changed because of AI and some of these new technologies? And, and more important, have you seen where they converged into one giant mega governance group? Well, where I would say they converge is all around data because you always have data governance. Okay. Um, and so yeah. that's a unique, if you think of like a Venn diagram, that's that's where they they intersect. Um, I think the 
you know, the team structure from what I've seen hasn't changed too much, but what I've more commonly seen is people are aware that these teams exist. Uh, whereas perhaps, you know, you might not interact with governance as much uh, mm. and, unless you had some situation arise. Now people are defaulting to working with governance teams to ensure that uh, appropriate policies are being followed. Uh, so I think just the awareness that these teams exist is the biggest change that I have seen. Yeah, I think we're seeing more board, more, more, Go ahead, more, board, more board members being on the governance teams as well, not not yeah. just insiders, but getting more and more outsiders in it because of the financial risks that are, that are going on. Mm -hmm. And Frank, I'm sorry for just uh, stepping in here, but um, I, this whole governance thing is actually uh, very timely because for the, the 24 survey that uh, we're looking to launch here, we actually have expanded a, a whole array of questions around governance, recognizing how significant it is, um, not only just in, in AI, but, you know, the security and in, in, in multiple areas, um, especially also in, in innovation, you know, as we're looking at the growth of new technologies and adoption, you know, what sort of uh, oversight is also being um, driven in that area. So I just had to comment, sorry. No, 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 your comment is timely and it, it's a great segue into another question as to what the um, what the 2024 survey looks like. And I'll save you the, the, having to say that it's starting in April 1st. April 1, no no joke, no fool. So, so, so. so uh, it will be doing that for real. What 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 do you see as being some of the, the, the sort of, a, I don't want to use the word modernization, but sort of timeliness of, of what the survey is is, is going to look like that might be a little bit different. In, in the sure, past. yeah. And again, just to go back for level setting, you know, um, it, it's not a static model. The, the mm -hmm. we As the market changes, we have the ability to moderate the questions to reflect changes in, in the marketplace. And, and so um, in the interoperability in you know, a population section, again, very timely for what we're talking about here, um, there's the whole issue around TEFCA and, and uh, the QHINs. That's an, a new area of, of query that we have brought in. Um, we want to know what organizations are doing, what their plans are, and, you know, um, with QHINs, uh, you know, what, what their strategy is. So, again, those are the type of things that we are em embracing. Uh, I like that. And, again, I mentioned earlier about the um, artificial intelligence and, and governance are two areas that we have expanded the array of questions on. Um, throughout. So we will take a look in, in that area. Probably m m the most significant change is um, we've asked a lot of the same questions. I've taken a lot of the same questions from last year's survey instrument, um, but I, I've changed the focus somewhat. Uh, so last year, a lot of the questions were what I call the binary. Do you, do you not have this capability? But strategically, I've been trying to move this into really focusing on data usage, the usage of, of the digital health technologies. So a question that was asked last year may now be uh, cast this way, is that how would you characterize the adoption of said technology in your organization? And then we have uh, partitions in terms of fully deployed, partially deployed, and we have, again, very, uh, uh, very, um, rigorous parameters of what do we mean by fully deployed, uh, deployed, partially deployed. But the intent there is to get away from, yeah, I have this technology, but I may have it only in one hospital of our system, or we only have it in one unit, to really to now look at how um, widely embraced it is in the organization. And that gives us, you know, that closer towards um, looking at at the truly the adoption uh, of the technology. So that is a really probably one of the most significant uh, changes this year as an addition, again, to focus on AI and uh, the governance. And I'm really excited, you know, of, uh, the the other thing that we did last year, which we have received such great feedback on, and we're looking the way to enhance it this year, is um, not just providing what is the average score, but really break it down to, you know, the size of the organization. So Jessica, when we were talking earlier about, you know, these different organizations trying to aspire, 
you know, some organizations, it's not even um, a, a appropriate or applicable that they'll ever become a level 10. But within their bandwidth, then to be able to really compare themselves, um, I think that's so significant. And so that's one of the things that we're also really expanding this year too, Frank. That's great. I have one other question that came in. It just, I, it, and I, I like this question myself because I, I, I tend to operate more on the international side. In the work that you do, I mean, InterSystems is a global company, obviously. I've, I've known some of your international counterparts. Uh, do you see any cultural variances in terms of this whole notion of interoperability or is it is it really uh, a, a lingua franca in terms of, I mean, are there, are there different places where it's handled differently? Obviously there are legal aspects that are different, but it, it culturally, do you see anything different? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I will say that I work only in the North American space, so I see only the U.S. Uh, well, then the Canadians. You can talk about the Canadians. The Canadians. <laughs> here, we, um, got but, one. we got one up in the left-hand corner here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, I, what I've at least observed from uh, my colleagues that work in the international space is there is just as strong of an emphasis um, and they have their own, um, I'd say, uh, challenges in working with uh, interoperability. There are some things that are easier depending on the region or the country that we're working in, right? But uh, we have found that at least our interoperability technology has been um, leveraged and been incredibly beneficial to breaking down silos across the entire world. Um, so while, you know, these specifics by which, you know, interoperability becomes a challenge, uh, the solution is, it seems to be um, rather uh, universal, I would okay. say. Okay, I would think so. I would think so. And the last question we had is it, it's sort of a... It takes a village question uh, that that you know you have relationships with providers and payers and other people that are typically healthcare, and they have relationships with other people, sort of a what it used to be called town and gown between universities and cities and so on. Are you seeing the scope of that village expanding? I, I I'm I'm assuming, and I I know as a fact that 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 the the pandemic did that that it it you know it it, it brought healthcare closer. To, to public health and other things. Are you seeing it the tentacles spread in terms of the clients that you're working with, with partnerships that they have with other vendors, obviously, and with other institutions? Absolutely. I think uh I think organizations are hungry for data. Uh, and that's driving a lot of partnerships at this point in time. Uh, I also think that uh users are hungry to participate now. And there's a more willingness to to have those interactions, um, as you mentioned that that provider payer landscape. We're also seeing evolutions in in mandates that are enforcing interoperability among these players as well. Mm -hmm. So whether it's you know coming from all of those different angles, I'd say absolutely. I think the scope of this continues to grow because every time you interoperate or integrate with one partner, that partner brings with them. A whole set of partners as well, and so these networks continue to grow and grow. And I'll, I, I believe that trend will continue. This is great. Uh, as usually happens, uh, time is not on our side, so we're we're going to wrap it up here. I'd like to thank you uh, for your your great insights. It's yeah, it's really, good. really it's building a lot of gaps for us too, and it helps us build the uh, the most wired uh, survey it, it, it's stronger and better going forward. And and Lauren, thank you again for your insights about the survey and your your view of what it's going to look like in 2024. So uh, thanks to all of you and thanks to InterSystems for their support. We appreciate it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.